good to see everyone today. It's wonderful to be out in person, beautiful location. Thanks for, for hosting this this morning. So great to meet both of you. This is uh, my first time in introduction. So if you want, let's just go through a little bit of introductions for, for you, John. You'll start a little bit about Robert Wood Johnson, your, your new role, and uh, what the organization's doing in, in community health. Sure. So first off, thanks for having me, Aaron. You tricked me. I thought I was winning twenty-five thousand dollars today. So <laughs> we'll we'll settle that later. Uh, I'm a reformed finance person. I actually grew up very close to here. Went to high school at St. Peter's right down the street. Um, it's amazing how the state has transformed, particularly Jersey City. Congratulations to the college. Uh, our organization is one I'm so proud of. Really, uh, we're a thirteen hospital health system. Uh, with a growing network, a partnership with Rutgers, and deeply invested in our community. As you know, healthcare is local. Um, we're excited about anything that you all can help us with in terms of bringing healthcare into uh, maybe the 20th century as it relates to patient experience. It's a people business. Um, sometimes it requires touching you, um, but digital enablement and helping us with consumer satisfaction is, is really the journey that we're on. So thanks for having us. Can't wait to talk more about it. That's great. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, John. That's on. Are you on? I think so. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, LabCorp, uh, I think everybody has probably heard our name by now, especially after the pandemic that we've been through. We're a diagnostic company and we're a drug development company. And I'm not sure everybody knows that about LabCorp. We are one of the largest clinical laboratories in the world but we also are a drug development company. We bought Covans a number of years ago. So uh, I think some of the impact we've had on the healthcare community most recently was during the pandemic, was bringing PCR testing. We were the first to market with that. Um, we brought capacity up to nearly 300,000 tests per day that we were performing on a regular basis, did over, over 60 million tests in total of PCR testing for the pandemic. And while we were doing that, we were also working on the vaccines and rolling out vaccines. So that's on a, a global stage of what we do. But what we do in the community is really, I think, what, what touches a lot of us that work for LabCorp. We are very much aligned with Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas in giving back to the community and trying to address a lot of the underserved community when it comes to healthcare disparities. And I think top of mind that really was brought to everybody during the pandemic was getting access to good health care for a lot of people. So that's what we try to invest in both on a corporate stage where we have both a venture fund and a foundation fund, but also uh, realistically in the community here on a divisional basis. And that stems right from our frontline employees getting involved in uh, adopt a school programs in food insecurity, supporting food kitchens, supporting food pharmacies and mobile grocery stores. So that's really what makes us very proud to work in New Jersey and support our communities here. That's great, thank you and, so and much. And before you ask a question, I just sure. wanna interject with a thank you to Kathleen and LabCorp. So we're a not-for-profit, so we're, we're very vested in giving back to the community. It's amazing to see a company like that do that. And they really do stand behind it, I can tell you, when our hospitals were um, flooded in the emergency rooms in the last wave of Omicron, it was wonderful to see LabCorp step up with additional testing facilities, supplies, support for our staff and communities. So it's a great organization and thank you for that partnership. That's great. So this, this panel, we're really talking about technology and the modern patient experience, right? So. Uh, pandemic, I think, pushed healthcare fast forward, uh, embracing technology in ways we probably didn't think possible, or perhaps we thought possible, but to go through the process of actually implementation takes a long time in healthcare sometimes. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, the, you know, for the entrepreneurs that are sitting in the audience today, the, like what tools and systems um, are you building to uh, have inclusive uh, types of patient care and uh, looking at that patient experience through the lens of technology? So I'll start and, and please jump in. It's amazing to me when you think about like this device and how far it's come. And I just ordered myself a coffee to pick up on the way out, paid for it, I'll be able to go in and you know get it with a, with a pretty high degree of satisfaction, efficiency. 
But when it comes to an experience, even with our system where we're trying to lean into it, it's so challenging. When you think about healthcare um, access and using your phone and privacy rules and all those things, it, it, it becomes difficult. And if you take it a level below, the infrastructure to support all that, when you think about electronic medical records, getting patient information in the hands of the patients where it belongs, automating things so that there's a standard of care or tech-enabled support for our providers. All those things are important. So we are on a journey to convert our core information system. Uh, we're, we're moving to the Epic platform. We've added the Sparrow footprint. That creates a chassis such that we can have patient information portable for any venue of care. Um, what it doesn't do that easily is make it easy for a patient to interface. There's native apps with Epic, there's ways to schedule, there's ways to interact, but if you've ever been a consumer of healthcare, the time when you need it most, it's difficult to find information about whatever. Uh, I recently um, suffered an injury and had to have a surgery and understanding, even for myself, and you would think I would know because I'm in the business, who to go to, how to get there, what I really need, is it a surgery or are there other things I should do? All that content, people turn to Google for. And a lot of times they get redirected quickly like any other organization. There's a lot of purchasing of website. I, I would say the thing that we're striving to once we get that stable base in is how to deliver content to engage patients more in their care. And that really, you know, one of the things that I think we'll see when we're successful is not only providing a good system, but having people more engaged, more informed about the care that they need. So solutions that do that are, are things that we're doing, but we're first investing in a strong backbone. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with everything John just said. And just to add, what we're looking at and what we've been doing is really investing in new technologies and investing in companies that are bringing new technologies forward. So even though we're a large Fortune 500 company, we partner with a lot of small entrepreneurs and small companies who are developing technologies to make healthcare easier for people to access. So uh, whether that is patient education, digital platforms, we recently acquired Ovia Health, which is a women's healthcare platform for helping uh, pregnancy planning, postnatal planning, planning for after child care. Uh, gives a, a lot of great educational tools on the digital platform. Healthcare has just transformed over the last 10 years so dramatically, and it's really an exciting time to be involved in healthcare because of the personalized medicine right now that we're looking at. We look at the digitization of slides, that doctors can read biopsy slides on a screen now instead of on a slide under a microscope. AI, artificial intelligence, there's so much going on. And I think the way people access healthcare is so different today. Years ago, you sat with your physician in his office or her office, and they explained to you your treatment plan, your diagnosis, your test results. Today, most of us get that through a portal after we've you know, had that office visit or had that virtual visit. A lot of young people, I know my sons, they'd rather not see a doctor. They want to do everything via an app or virtual visit. They don't want to have a primary care provider. So it's just changing dramatically, and we need to keep up with that and keep up with the tools and technologies to make that easier for everybody to have that access. That brings out a great point. So customer patient experience that varies based on uh, you know, many different factors. So you have um, you know, the under 20, then we have you know, different age groups, and particularly those that are aging. How do you pull them into how healthcare is, is today and utilizing all these technology resources that are available? Do you have, what's your strategy to reach all of those different demographics? By all, yeah, so you it. so by all, go ahead. It's challenging. I mean, it's, it right. is challenging, right? And I think that's one of the things that we all have to really keep in mind is that, number one, you know, we assume everybody has the iPhone that John was holding in his hand there before, but not everybody does. Right. And I think that came out during the pandemic, too, is that people wanted to do virtual visits, but they didn't have a computer at home. 
people were trying to homeschool their children because schools were closed and they didn't have internet access, even if the school sent home a laptop for them. So I think it's, you know, it's trying to address those issues and trying to keep that in mind. I heard a CEO of One Health System say when he was addressing this, it was pointed out to him very directly by some of his employees. It wasn't John. <laughs> and they said to him, you're assuming everybody has access to this, but they don't. And his thought was, well, then do we build resource centers where people can go in and get free access to computers so that they can do virtual visits if they don't want to go into the doctor's office so that they can use it for education? Do we have people there to train them how to use the apps, how to use those programs? I think that's some of you know what we have to think about investing in. Has anyone ever heard of sundowning? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, uh, it's a phenomenon when, when typically an older person ends up in the hospital and they're removed from their environment. And when they get that removal, sometimes there's confusion and other things. And what we know is when possible, care in your home setting is the best care. It addresses that in a way that's very helpful. Not everybody has that resource. Uh, what we learned during the pandemic, particularly when there was a shortage of hospital beds, a lot of admissions could have been avoided. And we set up a hospital at home program, um, which sent folks home with pulse ox monitoring, other tools and a way to interact with our clinicians so they recover safely in isolation with the support that they need. And I think Kathleen's point is excellent. So there's no silver bullet solution whether it's age, um, perhaps economic disparity and resources. But what we've been trying to do is figure out how to wrap resources around to get people to the right setting. Um, sometimes that means an access center like Kathleen talked about. Sometimes it means when you send that patient home that you need other support for them to be successful and things like that are critical. I would say um, the access gap and another thing, all of you listening uh, and competing, is thinking about um, the vulnerable population. You know, people with resources can travel. They will find the best provider. Maybe that they'll go into Manhattan or another location. We have the best programs here and, and trying to treat that population and trying to make it accessible, whether that's coming over a language barrier or some other way that might um, be challenged in technology is all very interesting to us. That's great. So this year's Better Wellness Challenge is about optimizing that patient experience. You've touched on a little bit of that. So for you know the $25,000 winner uh, later this year, what can you share with the entrepreneurs in the room and listening, perhaps online, uh, some strategies and some areas that you really find are significant gaps with technology and, and the consumer experience? I know you've mentioned a few, but are there more specific um, for folks out there that that they could really zone in on? I'll start. And so I'll tell you the thing that we uh, struggle with as an industry is getting feedback. Uh, it's required of us by regulators. So th there are surveys that are necessary and we send them out. Very often patients don't respond. Uh, you, you know, and it becomes difficult and we try to chase that down. We also don't have the best resources when you think of a retail environment for customer service. Um, one of the challenges is, you know, ultimately a lot of those questions can be clinical. So staffing a call center and then getting to the right clinician is challenging. And it's hard to get actionable feedback back to our teams. Um, it, you know, it would be interesting to me is some sort of smiley face app rating us that really gets data that isn't too burdensome for the care teams uh, that makes it actionable. So they know that what they might do different on that next visit in, in a way that's manageable. Don't know that that's easy. I think the challenge that we've always had is just managing the data, managing the content, ferreting it down. And you'll remember we're an industry that's heavily regulated. So all of the privacy rules and what can be shared become a challenge in some ways, but it'd be great if we can get that feedback directly to the people in a seamless way. Uh, I agree with that. I think um, I think bringing healthcare to where people are is so important. 
So like John was talking about the hospital at home program, right? That's so important. And that almost comes full circle, right? I mean, when I was growing up, you could get a house call visit from your physician. You know, when you were sick, you didn't have to go to the office. And now it's coming back around full circle. So it's not really new. It's just re-evolving like fashion. Um, but I think that's really important, bringing it to where people are. We partnered with Walgreens a couple of years ago to put patient service centers inside their re retail space because that's where people were getting their prescriptions filled. They were picking up birthday cards, you know, and they could get their blood work done at the same time. So that is where we get the highest scores for patient satisfaction are people who visit those sites rather than even our patient service center sites. But uh, listening to John just say that about easy, easy feedback, I was just in London for a trip, and almost every restroom I went into, they had those, those faces now, right? Did you like the way the mm -hmm. restroom was taken care of? A smiley face, it was red, yellow, and green. And all you had to do was touch that to give them feedback. I mean, that's so easy and great, right? You're not answering 10 questions. It's not taking you 10 minutes to fill out a survey. You know, something like that, right? That's the kind of feedback that we want and that we need. And then, and then you talk about the, the data that we have. We have tons of data, but what do you do with it, right? It's how to use that and how to manage it. There's, there's tons, and, and there are regulations. There are HIPAA Privacy Protection Acts, but we have so much data. How do you use it to really make change and make healthcare better for people? I think that's about. They didn't have that when I was in London, but I wouldn't <laughs> use it unless it was outside the bathroom <laughs> next to the hand sanitizer. So, yeah. <laughs> right next to the sink. You can hit it first and then wash. <laughs> but it's true, those symbols are, and, and the feedback, you're seeing that more and more, right, post pandemic. And QR codes are popping up everywhere so people can provide that feedback. So in healthcare, and I come from the provider space, do we overcomplicate the process? So how do we streamline a quick and easy consumer patient feedback process? To your point of we can share certain information, but just getting that quick, immediate satisfaction, not satisfied with a few comments, do we really have to take it to that extended survey where that direct team has to know that, that piece? Or are we looking at overall feedback? So to those listening that could potentially help provide some, some technical tools there, do we maybe overcomplicate what we look for in healthcare because the, we're data rich, that's for sure. Well, 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 for sure you have an opinion on that, I share it. It is overcomplicated. If you all want to get on a writing campaign to the regulators in our legal department, um, there are a lot of things that we have to do. We have to uh, ask a patient if um, they need an interpreter. We have to do a lot of screenings that are necessary. There are consents that are necessary for, for treatment of care. I think it'd be interesting to think about how we um, do that easier, for right. sure. And, and if you've ever been to any hospital, you probably all understand what I'm talking about. So ideas that make that experience a little more seamless, because let's be honest, when you need care and you're in that environment, it's stressful to begin with, and, and anything we can do to make that a little more seamless for folks is, uh, I, I think, appropriate. We continue to endeavor, but uh, as you suggested, there's a lot of room to grow. Agree. I think um, one of the things that we, we've tried to do in our patient service centers, we have kiosks now, right? So that you can you can put your information into a kiosk instead of having to take the time to talk to somebody behind the counter. That's great if you know how to use the kiosk. Right? But we have a lot of people that come in that are you know, 80 years old and they're coming in for their, their glucose or their pro-time test. They don't really know how to use that kiosk. It's not really user-friendly if you're not tech savvy. So we had, to, we had people there teaching them how to use the kiosk. So it goes back to you know, that, that education, making it simpler, you know, trying to really get out to the masses and keep in mind you know, some of what John said earlier, you know, it could be cultural, language, economics. There's, uh, there's age. There's so many different factors to keep in mind when you're trying to develop anything. But if you're, if you're looking to innovate to touch as many of those areas and cover as many of those areas as possible, I think is, is key. I think we're about time. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you so much, John, for your time this afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for listening.